Peter, as I'm going to be reminded of tonight. <laughs> okay. Can we stop? We miss him. Here we go. So I'm going to stop. So, so far there's not one word, it's two different words. <laughs> I'm smashing my language together, damn it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. No, no, no. In all honesty, so um, I'm going to do a, just a quick summary of where we've gotten to, um, and then we're going to turn to the Higgs mechanism. Uh, and the Higgs mechanism is going to take uh, take us the rest of today and next Tuesday. Today will be a technical, functional summary of the Higgs mechanism, which is probably going to go whoosh to many of you, and that's fine because next Tuesday we're going to add a picture to it and the picture is really what transforms and helps us understand the Higgs mechanism. So just bear with me today, we will achieve something today, but this is just sort of getting you exposed to the Higgs mechanism. Don't think you're going to walk out completely understanding it. Hopefully that will be remedied next Tuesday. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, but what is happening next Thursday? Midterm. Uh, the midterm. So let me say a couple words about the midterm. First of all, the midterm <laughs> is the midterm next Thursday is open notebook. You are welcome to bring in all of your notes, your homework, solutions you printed out. I don't care. Physics is not about memorizing things in case you haven't figured that out. You know, when people are doing physics research, they open books and papers and they cheat and they copy down equations and they use them and everything. So it really, I'm not out to force you to memorize things as you can tell from your homework quizzes, okay? So bring in any resources that you want. I'd rather you not use computers. I don't want you Googling, you know, answers to questions because it's kind of hard to come up with questions that you could actually solve that you can't find the answer to on the computer. So no computers, but bring in all the papers that you want. Um, it's going to be about six questions, um, and uh, it will, so you might ask, what should I study in this course? Should I go back and watch all your videos again? Should I study the, the lecture notes or whatever? Here's what you should study, and this is the main reason I'm giving you a midterm. You should study the homework solutions, because I give them to you on the website, and none of you look at them. <laughs> You work your homework until you're either done with it or until you give up on it. And then you come and take the quiz and you never revisit that homework again. Whereas the homework is really where the key learning is happening. It's where you're doing computation. So go back and look at all of the homework solutions so that you understand all the steps. Because the midterm exam will be basically reflections of the types of problems that you've seen in the homework. Yes? Um, I feel like I remember last time the midterm was like you didn't have to answer every single You're question. You're talking about GR? Yeah. Yeah, I Basically. might or might not do that this time. There are going to be some some challenge questions which are irrelevant. They're just they're just interesting they're just interesting questions I'm going to ask you and you can think about an answer if you want, but they're not going to be for extra credit and they're not going to create they're not going to count against you if you get them wrong. You'll understand when you see the example. So are you saying you can craft the homework solutions? Yeah, you can print out homework solutions. Yeah. And trust me, if I thought that the only thing you were going to do was look up the digital copies of the homework solutions referencing my web page, I'd let you use your computer. But Google comes into the game if you have your computer. So if you can swear to me and prove to me that you won't use Google, then you can bring in a computer. But you just, I just don't want you Googling. What do I do here? Yeah. We send our notes electronically. We can swear Yeah. And that's fine. Can you just print out the homework solutions? Yeah, you can print out the homework solutions. You can, look, I just want to, I, I just don't want you Googling stuff, and it's hard for me to stand in this room, because then I have to walk behind you all and scope out who's Googling. Really I mean, yeah. but, then you, but then you just turn your desk. Anyway, so. All right, all right. So are there any other serious questions about the midterms? Because we got to get started. Okay, let's go. All right. So, um, so far, we have the following information at our, hand, at our disposal. We have three Lagrangians of the following form. We have a scalar free Lagrangian, which is often called the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. Um, and uh, someone came to my office earlier, oh, it was you, and you were getting help on the homework, and I, 
I was writing down Lagrangians as integrals, which they can be integrated over something, but that's the action. I should have been referring to an action. So the Lagrangian is itself not integrated, but anyway, my bad. Um, but that's just my memory. Uh, anyway, so we have the Lagrangian for a scalar field, also called the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. We have the Lagrangian for a spin a half field. That is, of course, the Dirac Lagrangian. And then we have the Lagrangian for a spin one field or for a vector field. 1 over 16 pi. Sorry. That's okay. That was 8 pi. <laughs> okay. There's an 8 pi from the master. Okay. That was hard. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, um, just, oh, just a random question. If we happen to use natural units on the quiz, is that going to be a problem? Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, this, is, this is really, this is a quick review of what we've done so far. So all of these, of course, imply the satisfaction of the uh, mass shell condition, E squared over P C squared minus P squared equals M squared C squared, which is really just minus the magnitude of the four momentum. This is the spatial momentum, PX, PY, PZ, okay? And we demonstrated this because we showed that for a spin, for a spin spinner satisfying the equation of motion from the Dirac Lagrangian, every component of the spinner actually satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Also, for the vector field, which is in the Proca Lagrangian, if you write the equation of motion, you can demonstrate that every component of the vector here also satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. And then we argued the reason everything has to satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation is because the Klein-Gordon equation is just this, written in an operator form. You want to get another one? No, I just need to go to that. Good, all right. <laughs> okay, so, and, and this is gonna be a rather comprehensive, not long review, but I just wanna kinda of show you how, um, how little you've learned. <laughs> Kidding. Okay, so, um, to, to employ all of these ideas in in the reality of the universe we live in. In your homework, you've played around with different examples just to get an idea of gauging of scalar fields and all this stuff. But in the real universe, um, you start with, we start with a spin a half field. So you grab L1 half. And we introduce interactions via local gauge invariance. Okay, so what that means is we write down the, this action and we want to encode it first with a global symmetry. The simplest global symmetry you can imagine is just realizing that the spinners are complex and if you have complex anything, okay, these have four components, but that really doesn't matter. Just the fact that they're complex means that you can multiply them by pure phases, e to the i theta, and the e to the i theta here cancels with the e to the minus i theta from this one because this involves complex conjugation, okay? But you can also do more interesting things. You can say these spinners have three components in a color space, red, blue, and green, and then you can consider a transformation which instead of being multiplied by a number, it actually gets multiplied by a three by three matrix. Okay, so that's the first step. You take the Dirac Lagrangian, you wanna specify the structure of the psi, and then the transformations you can do on it based on that structure, and that's the global symmetry you're starting with. And then you know what you do, you take the ordinary derivative that appears in here and you replace it with the covariant derivative which in general is the ordinary derivative plus i times a coupling constant times the number of gauge fields that equals the number of generators of the group. Now if you're just working with the fact that this is a complex valued thing and you're multiplying it by e to the i theta, then you just have one generator, so there's only one gauge field. So you don't really need this lambda. 
but if you are dealing with SU3, for example, you have eight generators, so you're introducing eight gauge fields, you have eight generators, lambda, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? To allow the A mu's to propagate, we introduce a kinetic term. which is this, but we have to set this to zero because generally we find that the... I thought you were in the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, I was. <laughs> um, with, the transformation, with the transformation law that you find for A, this term is not invariant, okay? So we just say, all right, fine, when I add in gauge fields, I have to add in massless gauge fields, so this is the only term I'm adding in, okay? With F mu nu generally being given by minus IG over the commutator of the two covariant group, or two of the covariant derivatives, D mu and D nu. Okay, so uh, what is important for the standard model? In summary, for E and M, we do a U1 on complex side. It's interesting. The Dirac equation automatically, the Dirac equation is the equation of motion associated with this Lagrangian. So you know you talk about the Lagrangian and you come about the equation of motion, either one. But the fact that psi and psi bar are complex is built into this equation. You don't have to add any extra structure. So it's like E and M is built into the Dirac equation if you let it be a local symmetry, okay? To get QCD, you of course have to change your starting point and the change in the starting point because you want three by three matrices to act on it is that psi now has three components, psi r, psi b, psi g. Each of these components is a four component spinner. Okay, so whenever you see psi, that's got four components, but those four components don't have anything to do with the space rbg, they have to do with space time. So those four components are important if you wanna do a rotation or a boost in space time. That's where that four component structure comes in because you have to act on it with a four by four matrix, which is a Lorentz transformation, okay? And then lastly, I would call it the weak force, but the weak force is not itself, by itself a gauge theory, it's rather the electroweak force. The electroweak force, as we talked about last time, is represented by this gauge group SU2 left cross U1Y, where this acts only on the left-handed components of the spinners, and the U1Y acts on both the left-handed components and the right-handed components. But the right-handed components don't come in doublets. Okay. So that is a, sort of a brief review of where we've gotten to using um, using the uh, gauge mechanism in order to generate interactions. Okay. Today we would like to embrace this problem that a gauge field cannot have a mass. And the reason we want to do this is because through experiment, we have determined that the weak interaction gauge bosons have mass. So you can either say there's a mass term, in which case the gauge symmetry is no good, because this is not invariant, or you got to find a better workaround, and that's what Higgs figured out, okay? But it gets better than that because you might or might not recall that in our analysis we also found that particles, if you wrote the Dirac equation or the Dirac-Lagrangian in terms of left and right components,
the mass term for the particles involves a mixture of left and right spinners. However, SU2 left only acts on the left ones. So is there any way I can do an action on left only and have this be invariant? No. Okay? So that means that all of the matter particles, that's everything that the universe is made of, also has to be massless. And that kind of disagrees with experiment. So we have a big disagreement with experiment that we have to address, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Any questions about this before I press upon? Press on? <laughs> press upon. I'm going to have a little sip of water. <laughs> Gabriel. One kind of tangentially related question that I thought about after Tuesday's lecture. So when we form our ethnic news, we do a commutator of the covariant of the new derivatives, right? Yeah. So these derivatives, when we were looking at uh, SU2 cross U1, right, they had both the the weak fields and the, the hypercharged fields. So why doesn't that form a total F mu nu that includes interactions between the the, the hypercharge and the I system fields? You wrote it, down it would. What? It would. It would? Yeah. But I thought when you wrote down the final thing you had two different F mu nu terms. Uh, let me find out and see what they say. Oh, you're going to need one too, man. I lost this. Ross, can you give me one? <laughs> 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 um, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Um, <laughs> is that what you're doing, Gabriel? You're asking questions to screen? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually also have a legitimate question. Well, let me let me. Yeah, I'll wait. I'll wait for Yeah, you're actually, you're actually, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 it works, it works out, um, no, I'm actually not sure, I'm not sure, I'll have to do that, that's a very good point, Gabriel, so, Gabriel's question is, and this is related to what you just took the quiz over, by the way, um, is you have two, you have two gauge groups down here for electroweak. You have SU2 left cross U1 Y. This is the same as what you would have encountered on your quiz, which is where you had U1, U1. Um, on your quiz, you had D mu is D mu uh, plus IG A mu for the first U1 plus IG A mu for the second U1. Okay? Huh? Oh, sorry, two. Two. But F mu nu. I claim is d mu d nu, which means that you are invariably going to end up with. Oh, so you, don't you have two different couplings for the two fields? Yeah, yeah, two different couplings is, is also important. But um, uh, Yeah, so this construction seems as if it's going to introduce interactions between these two groups, which I wouldn't anticipate because that's an abelian set. I'll have to think more about that. 
healthcare bill? It's a really good question, and I don't have the answer off the top of my head. But what I wrote in the last in the last lecture was that um, this one would give rise to an FBU new, and this one would give rise to a second FBU new. And that's it's not clear that that's actually the case, but I'll have to think more about it. Yeah. Pause. Neutrinos are in the uh, left hand group, not the right hand group. Yes. Um, and that's if they don't have mass. If they do have mass. Like, we at this point. No, 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 no. If they do have. So, the, no, 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 no. Okay, so the neutrinos are only here. Right. And I said there is no right handed component to the neutrino. If the neutrino has mass, there is a right handed component, but this group still only acts on the left. Okay. Oh, oh right. Yeah. All right. Other questions? These are really good questions. All right. Um, here we go. Let's go down the Higgs path. And again, this is going to be a little bit dry. Well, it's not going to be dry. It'll be interesting, but it'll be a little bit um, technical today, and then we'll illustrate it with pictures next time. I don't know. Sure things. Okay. So um, we are going to first of all. Um, well, I'll just start with the Lagrangian. So I want you to consider the following Lagrangian, which is a playground for illustrating the Higgs mechanism, the actual Higgs mechanism applied to the matter fields in the standard model is way more complicated than the story I'm about to tell. And if you want to apply the Higgs mechanism to the actual standard model, that's fine. But I'm just going to give you the most cartoon version possible. And then if you want to do research in this field, you can learn about what it looks like when it's applied. But, so um, I want you to imagine we have a, uh, a complex scalar field, OK? And then I'm just going to throw a couple of extra interactions on it. So we're going to put in a mass term. And then we're going to put in a quartic interaction term. Is there no C in that mass part? Because hasn't it normally no. been like No. Okay. Yep. Okay, so phi is complex, so I'll refer to the real part as phi 1, the complex part is phi 2. Okay. This is, of course, just a spin 0 kinetic term. This is a quartic self interaction. Quartic just means power to the fourth. It's self-interaction because it only involves phi's. There's nothing else there. So it's just phi playing with itself. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> what is this term? Ah, let me draw a card. Josh. <laughs> Which one? Joshua Lewis. All right. What is this term? Looks a lot like a term we've seen before, right? Maybe. <laughs> it looks like uh, the last bit of the Lagrangian. Which is? The mass term? The mass term. Yeah, exactly. Except there's a problem with it. It's got a minus in front of it. It's got a minus in front of it. So let's explore what that minus means, OK? First of all, this thing should be positive. So what this is really implying is that the mass, this mu thing, is actually negative. So that's like saying the mass squared of this field is negative. 
which is pretty straightforward, right? And okay, let's see if we can explore what that implies. So let's remember the mass shell condition. So this is less than zero, which means that p squared is greater than e squared over c squared. And if I put in what p squared is, it's just gamma, remember these are the relativistic energy, the relativistic momentum. This is gamma squared, m squared, v squared, and the relativistic energy is just gamma squared, m squared, c squared. Okay. So if I follow that, this is less than zero, so p squared is greater than e squared over c squared, and then I'm just filling in what is but spatial momentum, relativistically, it's in gamma mv, but you're squaring it. And then what is the relativistic energy? All right. Anybody see the problem? Yeah, what's the problem? It's attacking those fashions. Yeah. So this negative mass thing appears to be tachyonic. It appears to be a particle moving faster than the speed of light. I know! I know! Yes, question. Shh. It's really hard to hear him because of them, so you gotta be quiet. Yes. Uh, M. No, it should be M squared. Okay. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. We gotta, we gotta move on. Okay, um, so people get really excited when they recognize that something is tachyonic and then they learn a little bit of physics and they realize they have no idea what the fuck a tachyon is. So don't worry about it. We don't have particles moving faster than the speed of light. This is actually indicative of something way more boring but useful in terms of the Higgs mechanism, but we're gonna talk about that next time. For today, we're just going to take this Lagrangian as our starting point, and we're going to pull some magic from it. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. All right. So, um, what symmetry can I expect from this Lagrangian for phi? Let me grab a name. Hunter. We'll do this one. <laughs> what symmetry do I expect? Is somebody finally turning in their quiz? <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, Hunter, carry on. What, what symmetry do I expect from this Lagrangian as it's written without promoting phi to like a three component object or anything? Uh, Let's try the other hunter. Uh, <laughs> it's really hoping he had the answer. Well, it was your card, so. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just said, can it be me? <laughs> and I was like, sure, yeah. But, uh, it's actually your card, so. Uh, what symmetry? Shh, now, come on, you guys, you gotta wake up. This is the same Lagrangian I showed you in my review. And, or sorry, yeah, no, in the review. And I argued what symmetry it has to have. Is it what? Yeah, what, what, what kind of transformation are we talking about, though? So I have phi star phi, and I want this to be invariant under the transformation. What can I do to phi that would leave this invariant? Oh, yeah, yeah, you multiply phi by a pure phase, and then phi star goes to... So when you multiply these together, these cancel and you just get phi star phi. Okay? So this is invariant under multiplication by pure phase. That's the U1. So we're going to, um, we're going to promote the U1 
to a local symmetry. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but this is the fourth time I've gauged the symmetry in this class. I'm going to follow the same four steps, ending with a beer every time. Every time. It's time for real. <laughs> but anyway, I'm showing you this procedure because it seemed maybe illusory and weird and complex the first time. It maybe seemed more complex the second time because it was non-abelian. We did SU3. And then the third time, I broke the spinner up to the left and right, and I did all this. Here we're going to go right back to U1. I want you to learn this procedure. It's going to be on your midterm. But it's probably one of the most core developments in the material in this class. So it's worthwhile to understand the steps. And it's, you know, yeah, it can get more complicated depending on the group, depending on the structure, but it's the same four steps. And I mean ending with getting a beer. Here we go. So one, uh, we recognize the global symmetry. So I have to write this down because, you know, you've got the freedom to pick different things here. Like I could define this transformation to be e to the minus i theta, and then phi star gets the e to the i theta, and that changes signs in various places. So for today, we're going to just multiply this by e to the i theta. Um, and then, of course, phi star goes to e to the minus i theta phi star. So this is the global symmetry, which we're going to promote to a local symmetry. So I'm going to let phi become e to the i theta, depending on x mu, times phi. And to do that, as you're all aware, we have to replace the ordinary derivative by the covariant derivative, which I can write as. And what constants you put here can change by convention. They can be soaked into the a mu, but I'm going to do i q over h bar c. And then, of course, to make the Lagrangian invariant under this local transformation, you guys all know what happens. This Lagrangian is not invariant under this, because if you put this transformed phi right there, that derivative acts on this and this, and that creates extra terms, which screws it up. That's why we have to redefine the derivative. But redefining the derivative is introducing this new gauge field, which itself has to transform. And so you use the demanded invariance of the Lagrangian to figure out how this must transform. And in this case, you find out that it transforms in a simple way. Okay. And what coefficients go here depend on the conventions that you're picking, so don't worry about the coefficients. But it's always, for a U1 gauge symmetry, it's always A mu minus D. Okay. Um, so last but not least, we want to let the A mu propagate. So we want to add the Proca Lagrangian with the mass for A equals zero. And this gives us in total a Lagrangian of the following form. I'll write it up here. Are you run out? Uh-huh. I like this story. <laughs> Oh, by the way, before we get to the end of the lecture, you guys should start coming up with jokes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> because at the end of the lecture, I'm going to write something on the board that's going to take me a solid five minutes. So you guys should just go ahead and start digging around Google, which is I know where you're pulling your jokes from. Honestly, I resent that. <laughs> Alex, our jokes are okay. Hey, Alex. Not yet. <laughs> Gosh, Avery, what the hell have you been doing, drinking? <laughs> I can't prepare. 
Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? So far, we, we now have a theory. We now have a theory with U1 gauge invariants. We had to introduce the gauge field A. We let the gauge field propagate. There are interactions between A and the phi field. This term right here represents that. Of course, it gets multiplied into these. But you have terms that have A times phi. So there's an interaction. So and that interaction is a product of us localizing this gauge symmetry. And it's a massless gauge field. Okay, we took the Proko Lagrangian with the mass equal to zero. Okay? So for now, I mean if you're in class, so I know you don't, but if you had a beer, you'd take a sip. Now folks. Now I want to tell you about nature, how nature works. Okay? Nature works by there being these fields which are defined over all of space and time. The electron field, the one single electron field that exists in this universe, it lives all over space and time. But what is a single electron? What is it? It's a perturbation in that field. It's a small fluctuation in that field. Okay? So, um, you might ask yourself, well, what, what is the configuration of the field background? above which things are fluctuating. Is it just that the field takes the same value everywhere, like it takes zero everywhere, and then an electron is just a non-zero fluctuation? How do you know what backgrounds to allow? Okay, This is going to be an important part of the picture that we develop next time. But for now, I'm just going to give you how we play this out when we're doing calculations. So first of all, what we do is we take this Lagrangian and we get the equations of motion, the classical equations of motion that are associated with it. Okay? And then we solve them to get the backgrounds. That is, we get a field configuration for phi and A. These are the two fields. If you have the configuration for phi, you automatically have it for phi star. Okay? Then, Once you have your background fields, you're going to let them fluctuate, and it's the fluctuations that you will treat quantum mechanically. Gabriel. So in order to solve our equation of motion, don't we have to have boundary conditions? Yeah, yeah, you'll have to have boundary conditions, for sure. How would we say the boundary conditions? Because isn't that like some way knowing something about the background? Like, would we go out and measure something? I'll answer your question when you leave. I know you're about to run out of the room, so. <laughs> Bye, Gabriel. <laughs> Madison. Um, so what exactly are B and AB here? Because you talk about like a singular electron field or something. Well, first of all, this, so, so you can think of phi as the matter field. I mean, this okay. is not a direct spin a half particle, so I'm not dealing with matter yet. Okay. So, but, but phi, is, phi is scalar matter and A is the gauge field. But they're both fields, so they both have to have a background, and then I let them fluctuate above that background. To get the background, though, so, so you, you have to bear in mind that this is ultimately all going to be fed into quantum mechanics, and we'll learn how to do the quantum mechanical calculations after spring break, or 
No, no, after we come back uh, from your midterm. It's not after spring break. But anyway, um, but, but you have to figure out what the field configurations are in the first place before you let them fluctuate, okay? So all I'm saying is you take the Lagrangian, you find the equations of motion, you solve them with boundary conditions, which is usually that they vanish at infinity, okay? And that gives you the backgrounds, okay? I'm gonna play this game in just a minute, okay? So, um, and the, the, the nature of what we're doing is called perturbation theory. That is, we would like for there to be a solution to the equations of motion and then just consider small enough fluctuations that we can expand in the coupling because the fluctuation itself is not very big and then we can trust the first few terms in the expansion in order to get the answer to a dynamics question. And we're going to go through that in more detail when we actually um, try and start doing calculations. Okay, so um, let me show you how this is going to work. So first of all, Generally speaking, you can take the Lagrangian and imagine that it is a, t a kinetic term plus some interaction term, which we might call a potential. Okay? And then what we do is we typically, to find the simplest solutions, because we could take the equations of motion of this. Okay, we could, you know, write down the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for this. But we're, we're, we're uh, what is the word? We're lazy, yes, we're lazy. We would like to find a quick and dirty solution to the equations in motion, okay? So a quick and dirty solution to the equations in motion is simply to say, if d mu of phi equals zero, and d mu of a mu equals zero, then all of the kinetic terms are zero. That seems like a really wild thing to assume. It's, well, just hold on. Just hold on. Okay. And then if we can find that the derivative of the potential with respect to the fields equals zero, then this solves the equations in motion. Okay, so you can bang out the equations of motion. I mean, they'll be complicated, but this is a generic, really basic solution to the equations of motion. You just ignore the kinetic terms, and you just want a maximum or minimum of the potential. Whatever the potential happens to be, and I'm gonna illustrate that in just a moment, okay? So now let's take our Lagrangian, let's break it up into kinetic terms and potentials. So let me just erase this to have access to this. So first of all, go ahead. Why do we want maxes and mins of the potential? Because it, the, equation of, the equation of motion is something equals zero, and that something involves the derivative of the potential. Okay. So here is the kinetic term for the scalar field phi. Here is the kinetic term for A. This guy right here is the potential for phi and phi star. So again, if we set this term to zero and this term to zero, and we just find the max minimum or maximum of this, the phi and the A that correspond to that will be solutions to the equations of motion. So let's look at one solution. Do this d mu d phi, and I'll just do d phi star. You could do d phi d mu d phi d u d phi or d u d phi star. But this is minus one half m squared phi squared plus one half lambda squared phi star phi phi. Okay, and if we factor out. Uh, 
So we can write this. So this phi star phi is just 9 to the phi squared. So clearly if I set phi equals to 0, then I'm dealing with the vanishing of du d phi. Why is the magnitude of phi squared times phi? Should, should there not still be a phi star somewhere? No, I'm taking the derivative with respect to phi star. So that gives yeah. me one half but squared the second term you have phi squared, right? Or phi star squared. I have phi star phi phi star phi. Uh, and the, the square of the phi star gives me a two here. Okay. All right. So this is clearly a background configuration of the fields that satisfies this condition and obviously satisfies these conditions. Because if a nu is zero, remember f mu nu is d nu a nu minus d nu a nu. So if that a nu is zero, then the f nu a nu itself is zero. Okay? All right. Now, this is going to be our background field configuration. And what we want to study is particle-like particle -like fluctuations. So what we want to do is we want to introduce a new field phi x, which is the, the solution in the background plus a fluctuation. And similarly for a mu. Is that x mu? Yeah, these are x mu's. I'm just cleaning it up. OK? I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to do. I started by solving this equation to find the background field configurations. These are the simple results. They're not the only results, but they're a very simple set. Then I want to let these backgrounds fluctuate. These fluctuations are particles. Okay. If I would like to figure out what dynamics control the particle behavior, I take this field configuration and this field configuration and I shove it back into the Lagrangian. If you do that, then this becomes It's exactly this, yeah. with a delta put in front of every a and every phi. <laughs> okay, so I want to reiterate what I'm about to say because I'm about to blow your minds. Okay? If this is the background we work with and we allow fluctuations over that background, then the Lagrangian, which governs the dynamics of these fluctuations, looks exactly like the Lagrangian we started with. Okay? Boring. <laughs> Useless. So, let's try something more interesting. Let's try a mu equals zero and phi is a constant, but it's non-zero. <laughs> 
okay? Clearly, if phi squared, I'm sorry, this should be mu, not m. Look at this situation right here. If phi, so first of all, if you want this to be equal to zero, you can set phi equal to zero, or you can just ignore the phi, in which case this just becomes lambda squared phi squared equals one half of the same in both terms, mu squared. So if I set phi naught squared to mu squared over lambda squared, this also satisfies that. But of course, phi squared is the real component squared plus the imaginary component squared, okay? Everybody on board? Okay. So I need a phi naught which satisfies this, but I have a freedom in how I choose it because I can mix the amount of here, this, between phi, the imaginary and the real component. But I'll just take a specific choice. So if I pick phi 1, the real part, to be mu over lambda, and phi 2 to be 0, and of course a mu to be 0, okay, this satisfies the equations of motion. Okay, look, phi is a constant, so the derivatives of phi all vanish, so the kinetic term for phi is 0. It's zero if you take phi to be zero, but it's also zero if you take phi to be a constant. Of course, this still vanishes because it's built out of A. This term is extremized because we actually solved this equation. Okay? Everybody on board with that? Because you have to accept what I'm about to write. So what we want to do is we want to let it fluctuate. So we want to take our phi one field And we want to start with this and then add in a fluctuation. We want to take our phi 2 field and we want to start with the solution and add in a fluctuation. And then we want to take our a mu field. We want to start with the solution and then add in a fluctuation. Okay? Now I'm going to give these names I'm going to call this mu over lambda plus eta of x. I'm just going to call this beta of x, and this will of course be a mu of x. This is zero, so this is beta, this is a mu, and then this is the eta field. And I just don't want to write delta anymore, there's no point. Okay, so I'm just going to drop the deltas. And when I talk about eta, beta, and a, I'm talking about fluctuations now. Because the deltas, they're, they're just going to be on everything, so you might as well remove them from everything. Okay? Are you ready? Yeah. You ready? <laughs> Go for it. All righty. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I'm a talent scout. I think that's, that's not aggressive enough. I'd say I'm more of a potential predator. <laughs> <laughs> not a joke, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg looks like Larry King. It's not a joke. <laughs> it's just an observation. Shouldn't you come to the front? Yeah, no, yeah go fine. Go right in front of the camera. Aren't jokes supposed to be funny? Right in front of the camera. Now, aren't I supposed to be funny? Aren't you supposed to be learning? <laughs> Am I? Look at the fucking board. Avery, <laughs> you can't drop F-bombs. It's fucking bad. <laughs> Having narcolepsy throughout puberty is, uh, you know, it's the opposite of a sexual awakening. <laughs> but having your teacher wake you up on account of the stain in your pants is... <laughs> So, uh, for the men in the room, where's the first place your penis was? It was inside your mom, is it? It was inside your mom. <laughs> Basically, every man in this room is a motherfucker. By technicality. <laughs> You're like a human push pop. You know, childbirth was like. these out of the book. <laughs> it's your textbook, man. <laughs> 
But, uh, you know, every childbirth is like basically an incestual. <laughs> it's an incestual version of Mission Impossible. You're hanging there. Why do you only have inappropriate jokes? You know, it's like a Birmingham County Hall meeting, right? You're down in Alabama. Everybody's point is to be back in their mother's vagina. <laughs> Hey, 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 I get it, I get it, you're angry, you're angry. It's not your fault, it's your mom's fault. So go ahead and go call your mom and tell her you're angry. What are you talking about? Excellent timing. Excellent timing. This folks, this folks is what we get if we take this for phi 1, this for phi 2, this for A, and shove it into here. It obviously gets a lot bigger because we're breaking up phi into phi 1 plus I phi 2, and we have to plug in this for phi 1 and this for phi 2, but nonetheless, there it is. Okay? Are you ready? <laughs> Neither am I, but here we go. <laughs> what do we have from this thing that is so nice? Well, first of all, you've got to just kind of remember the fields in this are eta, beta, and A. This is a constant. Okay? So for example, if I look here, I see a bunch of constants, a derivative of beta and A, so this is an interaction between this fluctuation and the gauge field. That's an interaction. There's an interaction, a quartic interaction of the eta, interactions of beta and beta, quartic, quartic self-interaction of beta. So we've got a lot of things that are interacting with each other, but there are a couple of important things to observe. First of all, we have a massive real scalar field, eta. Look at this. This is a scalar Lagrangian. This is the spin zero Lagrangian. One half the derivative, the derivative plus mu squared n squared, where we can notice the plus sign. Okay, so this is a real mass term. So we can compare this to the mass term that we normally see in the Klein-Gordon-Lagrangian, and we can extract what the mass is. It's going to be that mu squared is one half the mass of eta times c over h bar squared, which of course implies that the mass of eta is root two h bar over c times mu. Okay? Again, that's just taking this, where this is just mu squared times the fluctuation squared, and we're just equating this to the coefficient that we normally put, which has a mass term, and then we're solving for what the mass is, just constants times mu. Okay? We have a massless scalar, beta. And, and notice, I, 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 if I look through here and I try and find a mass term for beta, there's no beta squared term in here, okay? It's always beta times, say, eta, but eta is another field. So this is an interaction between eta and beta. Well, if, in that term, isn't there a mu out in front of it, too, though? So wouldn't that, so that term you're just pointing at, but this there's is, a mu out in front of that. But this is an interaction between beta and eta. A mass term is a purely self-interacting quadratic term. <laughs> this is not eta times any other field. So there are eta squareds in here, um, where was that eta squared I was just pointing at? Oh, right there. Or, sorry, beta. Sorry, there are beta squares in here, but they involve other fields, so they're interactions. Okay?
And then we have a gauge field, A mu. But look at this. That's the Procol Lagrangian. It's the F mu nu, F mu nu term, Avery. So the F mu nu, F mu nu term plus an A mu, A mu term, which we left off of this Lagrangian in order for it to be gauge invariant. But because we chose as our background solution this thing with this non-trivial piece, this thing has generated a mass for the gauge field. So what we find, this is the theme of what I'm talking about today and we'll illustrate with pictures next time. The fundamental theory that you're working with is this, which has a zero mass term. So this has a gauge symmetry associated with it. However, if we follow the procedure that we normally do where we assign a background field configuration by solving the equations in motion and then letting it fluctuate, by picking a non-trivial solution, we find that the fluctuating theory is determined in terms of a gauge field that has mass. This is the Higgs mechanism. This thing started out without mass, and it suddenly got mass. Okay? We'll talk a lot more about this next time. But that's all for today. Go ahead and ask your question. You guys be quiet. I have what? Three fields. Sorry. To get a mass term? No, to form an interaction, you can have just two different fields multiply together, or three, or four, or it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the mass term is just, the mass term is special because it's the quadratic in a single field term. Yeah. What about that mass term thing, that's the very last term in that equation? This? This is a constant. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't do. It doesn't do anything to the dynamics. A constant added to the Lagrangian doesn't do anything. I could have left it off, and it wouldn't change the dynamics. Okay. Okay, go, folks. I'll see you on Tuesday. We'll finish up page, and then you'll have your midterm for Thursday.